Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Stephanie Nichols. I'll be your host for today's uh, webinar. Um, I'm from the Housing Assistance Council. HAC has been helping local organizations build affordable homes in rural America since 1971. If you have any questions or would like to get to know HAC a little bit better, please visit our website, ruralhome.org. I'd like to make you aware of just two upcoming events. Um, we have a Section 502 packaging training in New Orleans in March, which has been incredibly popular, and the registration's full. Also is the wait list. Um, so those of you that got registered early, um, good job. Um, but we will keep you apprised of uh, additional 502 trainings that are coming up. Um, we're also working to launch um, the registration site for American Indian Housing Symposium in Rapid City in May. Today's webinar is the third in a three-part series, and, and the presenters today will give information on managing the construction process in coordination with USDA rural development, including construction draws, change orders, and final inspections. Information will be provided on the lease-up process, working with professional property management companies, affirmative marketing outreach, and processing tenant applications. The process for completing project closeout with USDA Rural Housing Services will also be reviewed. I'm pleased to in introduce today's two speakers. Um, first up is Jeannie Shaw. She's a nonprofit organization management professional whose expertise has helped produce housing, community, and economic development projects throughout the United States. With over 30 years of experience, she uses a repertoire of skills to assist nonprofit organizations build capacity. We also have Linda Martinez, and Linda's been with um, Community Resource and Housing Development Corporation since 2009. She started as an administrative assistant in the Asset Management Department, and today she's the Director of Property and Asset Management. I'm going to hand it over to Jeannie and Linda. Thank you. This is Jeannie Shaw. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we think that this series of webinars is going to be very useful uh, now and in the future because they will be available uh, on HACS website as well as on the websites for CRHDC and Tierra del Sol. So if uh, people were not able to attend the webinar, there will be a number of different ways that they can later on review the materials and listen in on the recorded presentations. So again, thank you all for your time and in joining us today. Uh, we have um, the te technical assistance providers that are presenting this information include Community Resources and Housing Development Corporation. They were established in 1971 to address intolerable conditions of migrant housing in Colorado. And they have uh, done this throughout the years. They now have expanded to address community needs in urban and rural markets on a statewide and regional scale, including activities uh, toward increasing financial viability and sustainability of families in the communities where they work and live. They have significant experience in developing farm labor housing, and this screen shows a few of the projects that they have been involved with, uh, providing technical assistance. Since 2002, Tierra del Sol and CRHDC have provided technical assistance on the development of farm worker housing using 514 and 516 funds through grant agreements with USDA Rural Development. And they now offer those services through the entire country. Tierra del Sol was formed in 1973 uh, to, achieve, to help New Mexicans achieve the goal of a decent home and suitable living environment. Today, they advance the needs of farm workers and rural families by, through their technical assistance and by addressing community housing needs through farm labor, housing technical assistance, self-help home ownership, and workforce investment opportunity programs. Tierra del Sol, as well as CRHDC, own and manage their own rental housing that includes farm labor housing. Both of the organizations are recognized as leading producers of affordable housing, and th this is something that we have found can only occur through collaborations with partners and uh, other resources. 
this screen shows some of the projects that Terra del Sol has uh, developed recently over the, or over the years. Uh, again, they have extensive experience in, in developing, owning, and managing farm labor housing. So what is Section 514, 516? Um, these are loan and grant funds that USDA provides for the development of farm labor housing. The 514 is a loan at 1% interest that's amortized over 33 years, and the 516 part of the program is a grant. Only nonprofit organizations and government entities can receive a grant. The program typically will allow up to a maximum of $3 million to a mix of loan and grant funds for each project. I think the most important thing um, that uh, these projects offer is that they do come with rental assistance or operating assistance, depending on the type of project that you're, you're going to be operating. And I just wanted to mention that it's our understanding that uh, Rural Development is going to be releasing the, the notice for solicitation of applications shortly. Uh, and there will typically be a 45 to 60 day time frame to submit those pre-applications. So if you are uh, involved in, in uh, pre-development or considering development of a farm labor housing project, it's best to begin early in assembling all the aspects that requ are required to apply. And of course, that's what we're here for. I, um, this map shows uh, the two organizations in which sections of the country we cover. So it depends on where your project is located. You could call um, either CRHDC or Tierra del Sol. And we also um, uh, will refer to each other if, uh, if you call us and, and you're looking for contact with the other organization. We're more than happy to help you out with that. So at our last uh, presentation, we wrapped up around the notice to proceed um, notice to proceed for construction. There was a, a meeting with uh, rural development, uh, and uh, they have provided the contractor with the notice to proceed with construction. So all of the pieces that needed to come together to result in that notice to proceed included getting final planning and zoning determinations, all the plan specifications, construction cost, development costs have been finalized. They've been put out to bid, and there's been a bid opening so that a contractor could be selected. All of the funding commitments necessary to build the project are in place. A, a comprehensive needs assessment and appraisal has been completed. The comprehensive needs assessment helps you understand what kind of uh, maintenance and, and replacement uh, needs the project will have over the coming years of operating. The appraisal, of course, is important in order to uh, close on the loan. The final operating budget, management plans, and the management agreements with third-party providers have all been in, are all in place. And so now USDA and all of the other funding commitments are ready for closing. That uh, wraps it up in a nutshell, but it's much more complicated than that. <laughs> so. One of the things that I like to point out is that in that pre-construction conference, many times what groups are going through is they're, they're conducting some value engineering, especially if, uh, if there's a need to drive down the cost of the project or there's unanticipated expenses that came up as the project was being um, uh, determined and, and the plans were being prepared. So value engineering is a step that is is important to make sure that the money is well spent on the project uh, and um, th that may result in changes to the construction costs. So just to keep that in mind, um, if, uh, if your project is, is tight on funding available to cover all of its costs. So once uh, we've com completed the notice to proceed, then USDA um, begins their legal review of all the closing documents. And so they are reviewing all the different project elements. 
This can take four to six weeks, so please allow time for that because this has to occur before you can close. If there's any changes or corrections that, that are needed, uh, that will add additional time to the process, so it's best to be in constant communication with USDA, your multifamily housing rep, um, to make sure that there's no surprises waiting for you. Um, and then after you've received your written closing instructions, it's important to address each of the items that have been listed. And many times this might involve working with your legal counsel. Um, some of these um, closing instructions may uh, pertain to the lien position that USDA wants for its loan, the type of ownership that they're going to require on the project, any requirements that are needed to clear title, um, insurance requirements. Um, those are just a partial list, partial list of some of the things that you may encounter. But once all those closing instructions have been met, the documentation has to be submitted to USDA so that they can approve them, and then a closing date is set. So I just wanted to cover the pre-construction conference again. Uh, this is something that can occur before closing or after closing. We recommend that it occurs before closing so that any questions can be addressed uh, at the pre-construction conference. So what's covered at the pre-construction conference? Uh, rural development and the contractor and you as the project sponsor are going to review the payment process, inspection requirements, any Davis-Bacon wage rate requirements, the process to handle change orders, how to use contingency funds. The process to draw down funds is going to include a review of the forms that are required and the time it's going to take to process them. And uh, any, con any um, contractor equipment uh, warranties that would be required and then, of course, lien releases from the contractor as well. So uh, it's a very important step in the process to make sure that everybody understands how construction is going to occur. And rural development will provide, rural development will provide instructions on these steps, and the contractor then can have any of their questions answered. So one of the other important parts in moving toward closing is to make sure that all of the leveraged funds are in place. So this may include grant funds or loan funds. Um, certain funding sources may require that they also attend closing, uh, especially low-income housing tax credit funded projects may have a requirement um, that their representative um, at least participate in, in reviewing closing documents. Um, so be sure to be aware of that. But uh, part of what you're going to need to provide is, is confirmation that all of your funding sources are in place. So if you've got uh, um, grants awarded, documentation regarding that, if there's other loan funds that are being provided, many times you're going to want to have simultaneous closings on the rural development loan and on uh, your leveraged financing. So one of the issues that we encounter in many of the projects that we work with is that there's multiple funding sources. So for reporting and compliance sake, it's very important to track all of the funds that are being invested in the project. Now um, I wanted to mention that we do have uh, samples of uh, sources and uses statements that we can share with you to help you track these. Um, many times your architect or, or your accountant also has these, but this is a good format for it because it explains the uses of the funds and which source of funding uh, provided um, the dollars for that. And if it's split between two sources of funds, this helps to easily see how that financing worked. And the sources and uses budget should be updated regularly to help you track whether you're going to have any excess funds in a project, which would be nice, um, or if there's any cost overruns that would need to be paid. 
as project sponsor, you're required to make sure that there's funds available to pay any cost overrun. So it's really important that you monitor all of that very carefully. So we finally um, get to the point of closing the loan with USDA. And I think um, one of the most important things is to become very familiar with the Handbook 13560, Chapter 8. Um, this is uh, an important part of the process. So it's best to be aware of what you are going to need to uh, do in order to close the loan. So of course, at loan closing, all of the loan documents are going to be signed. Uh, rural development is going to require that the person who's authorized to sign them on behalf of the organization be present at closing. And it's also a good idea to have your project architect or legal counsel attend, particularly if you're using complicated financing, uh, such as low-income housing tax credits. Many times, the title company is going to require that that you provide evidence of the corporation authorizing or designating the person who can sign the loan documents on behalf of the organization. So be aware that they may be requesting that in order to close. And then, of course, uh, it's very important to evaluate all of the closing documents. Um, so one of the things that we like to do is to request a projected settlement statement so that you can start to review the charges ahead of time and ask any questions if there's charges on, on the settlement statement that you were not aware of. And this is from Chapter 8. It's a checklist of uh, loan closing activities. So of course, um, you have your title company uh, that you're going to be working with, and you need to order your title opinion or insurance binder. I always recommend that you, if you know the site of your project, of course, it's best to order that title report early on, just in case there's any uh, issues that need to be resolved on Schedule B. Um, legal counsel may want to review the title report. And if there's any issues that need to be resolved in Schedule B, they can certainly help if there are complicated title issues. And uh, the Office of General Counsel is also going to require that they review the closing document. So they will need to receive copies of the settlement statements, the loan documents, the um, title reports, and any other documents that may be necessary. One of the other things that's very important at this point in time is to review the promissory notes and interest credit agreement with rural development and any of your other funding sources to make sure that it's consistent with your understanding of how that financing works so that you are aware of what your obligations are going to be once the loan is funded. And uh, another thing that can occur at closing is that any pre-development costs um, can be uh, paid through closing to reimburse you for those expenses. So your initial check uh, can, can include um, it, re reimbursement for your pre-development costs, such as appraisals, the CNA, if you had to pay out for your um, energy uh, certification, uh, some of the architect's upfront costs, uh, and then uh, your first draw for the contractor can also be processed through closing. So that's very important that you determine the size of that initial draw. And that the loan checks are ordered to the San, St. Louis office. So once uh, we have loan closing, uh, construction then begins. And uh, so you would be receiving multiple advances throughout the construction process. And after the loan is closed, Rural Development has certain steps that they take to um, record the loan within their system. So be aware that they have a process for post-closing activities. And again, uh, 
I'm going to refer you to the handbook, 13560, the Multifamily Housing Loan Origination Handbook. This is uh, very important to review this and understand the requirements. Uh, if there are questions, refer to the handbook and work very closely with your multifamily housing rep. They're following the handbook as well, and so if you have questions, they can help you understand what the requirements are. And it's very good to anticipate what kind of things uh, you may encounter uh, that could potentially delay closing or cause issues uh, as you um, go through construction. So the handbooks are really uh, very useful. So in preparing for uh, the beginning of construction, you would then prepare your first draw to request funds at closing. And as I mentioned, this can be used to reimburse for any pre-development costs that were paid up front. Anything that you are requesting to be funded through that first draw, you do need to require all backup documentation to show that it's an eligible expense, as well as you need to show evidence that of how payment was made so that you are eligible for reimbursement of those costs. And then through the construction draw, if there's advances that are required for deposits or permits, or if you need to purchase uh, materials for the first uh, for the beginning phase of construction, those are some of the costs that you can draw down through your first draw. But again, be sure that you have all all the backup documentation necessary so that rural development can review it and, and approve it. And then, of course, during construction, you are going to want to make sure that you track all of the receipts for any expenses that, that you incur. And uh, there's uh, forms that are required, of course. Uh, monthly construction draws are required by the contractor. And this is the form that they would use. Typically, it's an AIA form. And so it shows the uh, original amount of the contract, any change orders, the total contract, the amount of contract that's been completed or stored, like materials that may have been ordered in advance of installation in the project. There's a retention that's charged. And so then they show um, what the current payment is that is due. And this also shows the amount of change orders that uh, may have been approved for the project. So again, this is going to help you track whether you're on whether your budget your, that you have to pay for expenses is going to be adequate to pay for all of the costs, or if you're going to have uh, the need to find more funds for it. And then the partial payment estimate is, uh, shows the uh, contract change order summary. And again, it summarizes the, the estimates. And this requires the signature of the contractor and the architect and the owner uh, before it goes to rural development for their signature. And so one of the things that you want to make sure of is when you receive these payment requests that you carefully review them uh, to make sure that, that you are, are approving all of the expenses. And um, if there's any questions of the costs that you're incurring, now is the time to uh, raise them, or if you have issues regarding the quality of construction or the quality of materials. This is a good time to raise those questions with the contractor. And most projects will have change orders. Uh, typically, um, we plan those projects with a contingency of 5 to 10 percent of the total construction costs. And it really depends on um, how much money you have in the project to begin with. Value engineering can sometimes help to keep change orders to a minimum, but value engineering can also increase the costs um, because you're increasing the value in the construction itself. So again, uh, you need to watch the use of your contingency funds and uh, make sure that you've got uh, sufficient funding available to pay for the project costs. 
because it's the project sponsor that has to come up with any additional funds that may be needed. Uh, one of the other aspects of these projects that involve a, a loan is that Davis-Bacon wage, or a grant, I should say, is that Davis-Bacon wage rates are required. So if, even, if your pro, even if the wage rates for your project are higher than what is required by Davis-Bacon, the contractor is still required to comply with Davis-Bacon and submit monthly payroll reports. So there's two ways that compliance with Davis-Bacon can be achieved. A third-party firm can be hired by you uh, to conduct Davis-Bacon wage rate review, or perhaps one of your funding sources is going to require compliance with Davis-Bacon, and in most cases in that event, they will monitor compliance with Davis-Bacon themselves. Keep in mind that if there are non-compliance issues with Davis-Bacon, they can't shut down the job site until they've met compliance. So it's very important that the contractor understand those monthly wage reports are very important. And the pre-construction meeting is a time for all of uh, the contractor to go through what is required. They can review the reports and the process, et cetera. Another important aspect of the construction of the project is energy efficiency certification. Nowadays, most of the projects, I would have to say 100% of the projects that are selected for funding by rural development have an energy efficiency requirement in them. Typically, the more stringent your energy efficiency features are, you're going to get higher points, so you're going to, your project is going to compete better to be selected for funding. So this is a very important piece of the project. And uh, one of the aspects is that you, you may be required to um, coordinate inspections and testing in order to have your project certified that it meets those energy efficiency requirements. Now, other funding sources such as low-income housing tax credit, home, and CDBG may also have their own energy efficiency or sustainability program requirements. Some of those more common programs are Enterprise Green Community or Energy Star. Make sure you're aware of what uh, energy efficiency standards the project needs to meet. Uh, typically, you may need to hire a HERS rater if you're using Energy Star, and that is an extra expense for the project. The HERS rater is going to, and any of your energy efficiency uh, certification agencies are going to require that they review the construction plans up front, which is a very good time for them to do it because it's hard to fix things once the project starts being built. And then during construction, they will also be conducting periodic reviews at different phases of the construction. So they like to review it when the rough-in is completed and when you're ready to uh, enclose the, the walls with drywall and when you're obviously ready for occupancy and the project is completed, so they may come in and conduct lower door tests and things like that. Um, now, sometimes an architect may be certified, green certified, to conduct those inspections. Other times you may need to hire an energy efficiency rater. And it's very important that your entire development team understand the energy efficiency requirements of the project so that they can help support you in ensuring those inspections occur and that the project is built to meet those requirements. So finally, a miracle occurs and construction is completed. And that's being facetious because we all know that there's a lot of uh, angst and, and uh, hair pulling that can sometimes go on during construction. But we ultimately get there. And so then the, the final phase in completing construction is the construction closeout and uh, the warranty period. So at the time of construction closeout, a final walkthrough is going to be conducted with rural development, so you're going to want to make sure that the contractor is there and maybe your architect is there. Uh, you want to be there. Uh, punch lists will be developed. 
uh, that will need to be completed. Once the punch list is, is um, resolved, the architect will issue a certificate of substantial completion. Uh, keep in mind that uh, in order to facilitate occupancy in a timely way, sometimes projects may require a temporary CFO, so you're going to need to work very closely with your local building official if you need to have a temporary CFO. This allows people to move into maybe a portion of the project while construction is underway for the remaining part of the project uh, because it's important. Obviously, if there's a need and demand for farm labor housing, it's important that the housing units be available to serve those people. But once uh, you can, you need to make sure that the final certificate of occupancy is issued. Um, and that means another inspection to get that signed off. So planning ahead, uh, you want to make sure that during the warranty period with the contractor that you're advising the contractor when there are warranty issues with workmanship or materials. Uh, many times some of the problems uh, don't um, crop up until people actually live in, <clears throat> in the unit. Um, you know, there may have been a nail that went through a water line and once the water starts running through that line there's a leak and the contractor is going to come and fix that. Um, or an, a light fixture isn't working properly, the contractor is going to fix that. Um, so uh, keep in mind that uh, during the, especially the first year, you're going to want to, first of all, make sure the contractor takes care of <clears throat> any warranty issues that arise once people start moving into the project. That helps to keep your tenants happy. The other aspect is to make sure that you plan ahead for an 11-month walkthrough so that the warranty period doesn't expire before you have that walkthrough and provide the contractor with a final list of repair needs. And so that is going to help you make sure that the contractor performs all of the aspects that are necessary to keep your project in good shape and that all of your warranties are, are going to stay in place. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Linda, who is going to cover marketing and lease up. Linda? Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. So we will be going into the handbook to 3560, the multifamily housing asset management handbook. Um, it is highly recommended that you have an electronic copy, a binder copy. Um, there's 1717 pages, so I suggest break them up by the specific chapters. However, this is a very important handbook, so it's highly recommended that you learn it, live it, and love it. So chapter one, the introduction. The asset management handbook basically will is is the asset management procedures is made for section 515, rental, rural rental housing and Section 516 and 514, off-farm labor housing and on-farm labor housing. So it'll, section, um, the chapter one will go over the specific terminology, civil rights, reasonable accommodations, reviews and appeals of the property, any conflicts of interest. Chapter two breaks down the Section 515 program, um, the different types of loans, the types of projects, the um, off and on farm labor housing. It goes into depth about Section 515, 516 programs. Um, the 515, once again, is the multifamily rural rental, and the 514 is the farm labor. 516 is off farm labor. Um, chapter 3, Property Management. It goes over the project management responsibilities as far as having a management plan, um, how you plan to manage the actual property, the management certification, the borrow and management agent agreements, um, the role of the management agent as well. Chapter 4, Financial Management. It goes into the project accounting systems. Um, 
the accounting systems that are required, the agency approval, the methods of accounting, record keeping account requirements, different accounts that we must have, general operating accounts, reserve accounts, security deposit accounts, um, accounts for our specific capital needs assessments that are done on the property. Chapter 5 goes into project physical conditions. So the maintenance requirements and standards of a property, it will go in depth in that preventative maintenance, work orders, tenant damages, energy conservation, inspections. Chapter 6 goes into the project occupancy, the tenant eligibility requirements, um, the income requirements, determining um, eligibility for households, um, ineligible tenants, calculating income, um, any asset income. Let's see, Chapter 7 goes into the rent requirements, shelter costs, utility allowance for the specific properties. Chapter 8 goes into the rental subsidies. Is it project-based rental subsidy? Is it HUD Section 8? Is it private? Is it state or local? How those agency-funded rental assistance works, the allocation and distribution of the rental assistance. Chapter 9 goes into agency monitoring. Um, the specific agency monitor reviews from USDA staff, whether it be a internal review on sites or on, on the site or on the actual files of the project. Um, the different appendix, the 3560, this is very, very important in determining tenant rent portions, rental assistance portions, making sure that you properly qualified, gathered all the necessary documentation in order to put together a tenant certification. In that specific certification, it will go into the household members if there are any minors, if there are any elderly, um, the total annual income for the household on both employment and assets. That is very, very important to determine and get corrected the first time around because if it is not done correctly, the um, owner is ultimately responsible to pay back that money to the federal government. Any money that was misappropriated, any tenant certifications that were done incorrectly, um, it is very, very important that this 3560 is done correctly, reviewed, and reviewed again. Uh, let's see. Appendix 2, it goes in, into the National Appeals and Division of Rules and Procedures and the definitions of that as well. Appendix 3, forms referenced in this handbook. So once again, this handbook is 717 pages. So there are a lot of forms referenced in here. So Appendix 3 will just give you a list of those forms. Um, and the most updated copies of those are on the USDA government page. Um, appendix 4, handbook letters. Once again, these are just handbook letters referenced in this handbook. They are, uh, it's just a one page, let, just a one page form that goes over the specific letters that go out to tenants, that go out to borrowers or management agents. Appendix 5, it goes over the civil rights um, accessibility requirements for multifamily housing properties. It goes into new construction, rehab, equity, all of those specific ways in monitoring compliance. So those areas of the handbook you can always reference back to. That's why I recommend you break it up into chapters. Um, each chapter will break down exactly the information that you're needing. All right, so now we are going on to initial lease up. So when property management services will be provided in-house, the management company is responsible for, for providing training for staff on farm worker and income eligibility requirements. They must know the forms. They must know the processes. They must know the property management plan and must know the affirmative fair housing marketing plan. You need to know who is eligible. What are the requirements? 
the forms, the specific signatures. Signatures are huge. Anytime you're getting audited, one of the things that they're looking for are signatures on all documents. Um, the management plan. How will you run your property? When property management services will be provided by a third property management agent, you need to select your management agent 120 to 90 days before occupancy is expected. Once again, it is very important that your management agent is familiar with what type of property they will be running and all the policies, procedures, rules, and requirements. Provide the property management agent with copies of the property management plan and the affirmative fair housing management plan and monitor their compliance with these plans. Once again, we have audits that are done by RD. It is, it is suggested that you do your own internal audits prior to them doing their audits so you can kind of make sure that you are, you are ready for those types of audits and inspections. Initiate marketing activities at least 90 days before occupancy is expected. Once again, very important. You can have a list of people that have called and inquired about your property. That is not specifically um, a wait list. A wait list is something that you want to make sure that you, you have these potential applicants come in. You have the necessary documents. They know the requirements. Um, for eligibility in order to create an active wait list. The last thing you want to do is say I have 120 people on a wait list and then you go to get those units filled and only 30 of them actually um, qualify for your property. So 90 days before occupancy is expected, initiate those marketing activities. The affirmative fair housing. Marketing efforts and marketing tools must comply with affirmative fair housing requirements. Follow the affirmative fair housing marketing plan approved by USDA. Um, the fair housing poster must be prominently displayed in all office locations in which rental activity takes place. And the affirmative fair housing marketing plan must also be available for public inspection at all rental offices and locations. In this plan, it will talk about your target market. Um, in that target market, are you providing the correct language documents, brochures, flyers, whatever it may be for those residents that you are targeting? Um, your demographic, your advertising, is your advertising informative? Is it sufficient? Where are you posting it? Who is least likely to apply? Are you reaching out to those that are least likely to apply? Um, and how are you reaching out to them? These are all things that are very important in the Affirmative Fair Housing Marketing Plan and knowing that what type of residents you are actually target marketing. So how do we reach potential tenants? USDA has an excellent clarification um, of defining farm labor requirements. So in that document, it will go over eligible and ineligible activities. So automatically you think farm labor, you think farms, orchards, ranches, those type of places. You have to think out of the box and look within those eligible activities because it can go into the, the specific crop dust sprayers, the truck drivers. Where are these crop dust sprayers purchasing their specific materials? Where are they um, getting gas? Where are, they, where are we trying to target and find someone on our specific list that is an eligible, that is eligible for our specific property. So local growers, feedlots, packing plants, you can do presentations, you can have open houses, you can do lunches. Local Head Start programs, we, you can also go into the school flyers, those are excellent to get your information out to school flyers, school counselors, school nurses. Um, any local middle schools, charter schools, high schools, any type of schools in the area local health care providers, um, reach out to areas in which you wouldn't normally. So in the local health care providing facilities, you can put your flyers, brochures, cards, application packets. Um, local service providers, these are migrant coalition um, workers, uh, meetings, head starts, um, legal services that these local service providers um, have, health fairs. 
local housing authorities. Find out who your local housing authority is. Find out if they have a wait list, if you can tap into that wait list. Local refugee resettlement programs, and then your local Department of Labor. Once again, this is very, very important in determining tenant income eligibility and rent payment. If this is not done correctly, the owner is responsible to pay that money back. So you must know every household member, any household member 18 years or older that is working um, within farm labor or not farm labor, any type of household, in the household income that the household is receiving, this all must be um, documented. It all must be calculated and gathered in order to get this, this form correct. Um, social security numbers, are, the, are there any children in the household? Are there any full-time students that are 18 years or older? Are there any elderly, disabled, or handicapped residents? Um, is their asset, or have their assets been correctly calculated? Um, and if so, if they make over a certain amount, their specific income that they're receiving off those, so that has to be calculated as well. Any income calculations, wages, salary, social security, assistance, any type of income, this all must be calculated and put into this form in order for the um, proper rental assistance to be distributed to that resident. Once again, if it is not, it will come back upon the owner and they will have to pay this money back. So this, this specific form is very important. I would suggest having it reviewed um, after you have actually done one and then just until you're comfortable enough that this information is being gathered correctly, all signatures need to be gathered correctly for all household members as well. USDA's role in managing, in monitoring the project. So chapter 2.13 goes into property management, financial management, property physical conditions, the project occupancy, rental shelter cost, um, utility allowances, rental subsidies. Break down your handbook into your chapter. So when you have to go to a specific chapter, you open it up and your information is there. Make notes, add sticky notes. It's always good to refer back to it. Um, you want to know that you are properly maintaining the grounds, interior, exterior, your files, your units. So in the event you have any type of audit done by anyone, um, you are properly ready for that audit. And then once again, the handbook is something you can always refer back to on specific documents that you will need. Project management for farm labor housing. Section 5 of, of Chapter 3, it goes into the project management. So project management fees. There's management fees that the project for farm labor housing borrowers are required to maintain um, on a monthly basis. Insurance requirements for farm labor housing goes into specific insurance requirements. Um, special servicing requirements for your Section 514 on farm labor housing. It goes into the policy, the definition of rent, servicing actions, compliance, um, and any corrective actions that need to be taken. It also has attachments. In those attachments, it will break it down into the management plan requirements um, that you need to make sure you hit all your points on. Um, it goes into frequently asked questions, um, non-discrimination policies and practices that borrowers, borrowers must address. Um, cost and services to be paid from the management fee, it, these attachments, it goes into that specifically, and cost and services to be paid from the project income. Once again, it's always nice to refer back to your handbook to 3560 asset management, multifamily um, chapters, look into them, know them, refer back to them, make notes, all of this information is highly, highly important. Um, it all, at the end of the day, goes back onto, um, not the management company, but ac the actual owner. The owner is responsible at the end of the day. So in saying that, thank you for listening to the marketing and lease up phase, and I will turn it over to Stephanie.
Good afternoon, everyone. I do not see any questions in the chat right now. Um, please feel free to continue to type those in in the lower right. I am going to um, disable the lecture mode um, so you will be able to speak. Please, if you could, um, you know, mute your lines if you're not planning on speaking or reduce background noise as much as you can. Thank you. Oh, we got a question. Is interim financing not allowed in off-farm labor like it is on in off-farm? That's from Peggy uh, Coogan in Wisconsin. Hi, Stephanie. This is Jeannie. Um, well, we don't do too much with uh, off-farm financing. Uh, interim financing is allowed when you're developing on farm uh, because you need to have uh, construction loans and things like that. Um, I can't imagine if uh, uh, for an off farm project if the property owner has to demonstrate that they are unable to get financing from other sources um, that uh, they, they would necessarily have the cash available on hand to fund the entire project themselves. What might not be eligible is the costs of that financing. So P Penny, I, I don't know if that's helpful. Um, Mirna Reyes Bible might be a very good person to ask that question. Penny says thank you. Any more questions? Come on, I know you guys have a lot of good questions to ask. You're on the phone, you can ask them verbally. If your microphone is turned on, um, you can connect it in the top menu bar. You can give um, your computer rights to, to speak if you'd like. And you can always type them in. No questions? Give everyone one more moment. Okay, I do not see anybody typing. So I wanted to thank our speakers uh, very much for, for speaking today. Tierra del Sol, Community Housing Resources and Housing Development Corporation. Um, thank you for doing a wonderful job throughout the series. Um, I wanna thank everyone who's attended today and attended the previous webinars. Um, and I want to remind everybody that a recording of this session of the materials are going to be posted on the HACC website later this week. Um, hopefully, we'll get them out as soon as we can. Hopefully, it won't be the end of the week. I'll try to get it done a little bit sooner. But um, I want to thank everybody and have a wonderful day. Stephanie? Yes. Stephanie, I just wanted to add that if anybody thinks of any questions or if they're reviewing these uh, webinar materials uh, later on um, during the year. Uh, please feel free to contact uh, CRHDC or Tierra del Sol. Uh, we are technical assistance providers here to help you. So I just wanted to make sure people were aware of uh, that resources available for you. Thank you. And the, the contact term information is in the slides. So if you'd like to reach Jeannie and ask yeah. her a question that you're forgetting right now, um, we'll have that information in the slides uh, probably in a, an hour or two, yes. hopefully. There's, the last slide shows contact information. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.